born and raised in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is a beautiful country, full of love, light and joy. And for me growing up, this is exactly what that was. Zimbabwe is a country of pride, and we pride ourselves in respect. And how do you give respect? Through the power of words, through the titles that you give people, the names, the way you address them. Now growing up for me, I never knew the names of my uncles or aunties or grandparents. Everyone had their own title. And I couldn't wait until the day I could get my own. So when I was little and people started referring to me as something other than my name, I was ecstatic. I was taking pride in this. This was my moment. I finally had a position on the food chain. They used to call me Nerera. They'd say, oh, here comes Varaito, our little Nerera. There she goes. I never knew what the word meant, it didn't matter to me, but as long as I had my own title, I was happy. Now one day it occurred to me, maybe I should inquire, maybe I should check what this means. And I went to my uncle, walking tall and proud, I said, uncle, since you know how it is to have a title, you know, what does mine mean? He told me, as a matter of fact, he said, it means orphan. I was quite shocked by this. I was angry, I was hurt. I thought, why, why, why are people calling me this? And now it made sense why I was the only one in my friendship group, in my family, who was called this. And I went away and I said, hmm, what do I do about this? I want to change this title. And then the bright idea hit me. I had a mom. My mom was alive and well. I spoke to her on the phone almost every day. Yes, she was living in England. But she was alive nonetheless. So I went back to my uncle, head held high. I said, uncle, listen, found a loophole. You got it wrong. I'm not a Nerera. I'm just me. My mom is alive. And he looked at me. He looked at me with this look, this look of, ah, oh, this naive little girl. And he said, don't you understand? That's the point. Because your father died when you were two years old, you are, by definition, a Nerera. I said, but, but how? And I wanted to battle him and fight him. But then it dawned on me. Because my father had passed away, singular, I no longer had parents, plural. Women were invisible. In my society and my community in Zimbabwe, women are not as relevant as men. Despite the fact that my mother carried me for nine months, gave birth to me, breastfed me, raised me, that didn't matter. For as long as I didn't have a father, I no longer had parents. So from that early age, the power of words hit me. That one title of Nere defined who I was, how I navigated that society, and how I would go on to be in the future. My father dying meant that the women in my family no longer had status. We no longer had a place. We were only seen in the light of pity. So I took this on and I thought, okay, since this is what you want to call me, I'll behave as such. And I became pity. I no longer was just receiving it. I felt it. I ate it. I breathed it. I was the epitome of pity. I no longer looked in people's eyes. I walked around feeling sorry for myself. I was just angry. And every time someone said that word to me, it filled me with anger. But I couldn't react because the country is a country of respect. Your title, you take it and you own it. So I did. Now fast forward to England. I moved to England with my sister to rejoin my mother. And life was going well, I went to school, I was having a good time. And that power of that negative word I'd left in Zimbabwe was behind me. I was prospering, I was doing well. My academics were going great, everything was wonderful. And I had a bright idea. I said, I'm gonna repay my mother. I'm gonna give her visibility back. People wanna, you know, take her and say she's no longer invisible because my father's dead, no. I'll show you, your hard work, the hard work you've done raising me will pay off. I'm going to go to Oxford. I'm going to apply for the world's best university and show everyone that yes, I'm a girl, but I have a position in this place. And not just as a little girl who has a dead father, no. I'm more than that. I'm talented, ambitious, I'm young, I'm bright, and I'm going to show you. So I went to my teacher with the same resilience and attitude I had when I went to my uncle. I said, miss, I'm going to Oxford. You're going to help me. And I was so determined. And she looked at me. That same kind of look that my uncle had 
of ah, this naive little girl. She said, V, Oxford is not for people like us. And I looked at her, and I'll never forget those words. Those words have stuck with me. And I thought, what do you mean not for people like us? I, I, I have the grades, the desire, the passion, I love studying, and I've heard it's really intense, like what, 10 essays a week? I want that, I want that, I want a piece of that. And she said, V, it's not for people like us. And I went away, and I didn't apply. I did not apply for Oxford University. Why? Because she's my teacher. Most of our parents, and this is not a unique story for many students who come from the continent, the African continent, most of our parents have migrated here and started a new life. And they don't tend to understand the British education system. They don't know how to quite convert what they learn into how we learn here, so it doesn't quite translate. So our teachers, our teachers are our source of hope, encouragement. They're the ones who guide us. Our parents raise us, but our teachers, they're the most significant person in terms of academics. So when she said no, it meant no. I didn't apply. And that entire year, that ate me up. I thought, V, but you can do this. You have the grades. What's the problem? And I fought back. I said, no, I'm going to try again. And a loophole came about once again. <laughs> I got an email about this new scheme happening at Oxford University where students like myself from lower socioeconomic backgrounds could go to Oxford University and get a degree and they just start with this one thing called a foundation year, but then after that, you become a full student and you can, you can do this. And I went to her and said, look, you said it's not for people like us. Well, I found a loophole. This scheme is for exactly people like us. So I can go, right? And once again, she said, no. She said, you do know if they take you, it's only because you're black, right? And I looked at her and I thought, you know what? I don't care what you say, I'm gonna go. And I applied with the help of other teachers, and here we are, a second year student studying classical archaeology and ancient history at the University of Oxford. And I thought, that was a defining moment for me. The power of words, the way that she spoke to me, if I was any other student, that could have been detrimental for me. Yes, words are beautiful, they're kind, they're inspiring, motivating, empowering. But like all beautiful things in this world, Words are also dangerous, toxic, and it can be a deterrent. And for me, as a young person, looking at my teacher's face with that bright idea of going to Oxford, when she said no, that could have defined my life. Only being known up to that point as the young girl with a dead father who now wants to go to Oxford but can't go, that could have defined my life. But because by chance, I happen to be a student who's resilient, who fights, who keeps pushing for what she wants. Here I am today, but not all students are like that, and that's the key point of this talk. Not all students are like that, and not all students have to be like that. It's not our job as a student to have to shine brighter than any other star for you to notice us. As our teachers, our parents, policemen, society, people that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, your words matter. And not all students are as strong as myself or other people. We need you to guide us. You need to choose your words wisely when you're communicating about young people or talking to them. We take your words and we will run with them. So if you tell me I can't do it, I will go through my life not doing it. Now, when I got to Oxford University, I was excited. I wanted to prove that I could occupy that space like any other person there and I would do it well. And I am. I'm achieving high grades. I'm maintaining the same grade boundaries that I was required to, achieving the same as my friends. Now at Oxford, people tell me constantly, V, why don't you try this? V, you can do this. V, you are able, you're capable. My confidence in my academics is being restored. And that's not because I'm at Oxford. That could have happened at any university. Surrey, Exeter, LSE, Kings, anywhere. But I can only speak about what I've experienced, and that's Oxford, so you know. <laughs> but they restored my confidence in my academics. They told me I could do it. And I'm happy about that. I'm so grateful. But it shouldn't have taken that long. 
It shouldn't have taken for me to have jumped through hoops and fire and tried my best and said, me, 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 look at me, for you to notice me. And I think that's the most important message that I want everyone to take away from today, is that you are all impacting the people next to you. When that student comes to you with that eagerness, that desire, that passion, and they look at you and say, can you help me? Please help them. We cannot keep having future leaders, future people to rule this world slip away from our hands just because we're not paying attention to them. So I urge you all, whether you have siblings, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a parent, listen to the young people, especially the young black youth. We don't have many places to turn. When you say no to me, I can't turn on the TV and see a different answer. For some of us, we don't have that encouraging spirit from the society around us. When I turn on the TV, I'm constantly told that young black youth are bad. We are thugs. We end up in prison. We rob people. We do terrible things. That's the narrative constantly fed into us. And we need, we need to hear something else. So now when I'm at Oxford and I wake up every day knowing that I am sleeping potentially, hopefully, who knows, in the same bed as future leaders, people that have also slept here, ate here, went to the same library as me, that fills me with fire. Even if someone says to me that day, V, you can't do it, I'll say, okay, that's fine. I look at the walls of all the titles of all these people that have been here, prime ministers, presidents, whoever, and I have that urge. But like I said, not many young black students have that. There is no other outlet to look at. So our teachers, politicians, society, media, everyone, you are all responsible for making sure we raise the next group of future leaders. And with that, and this is genuinely something I've always, always wanted to say, thank you so much for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs>